in 1985 returned to Oz traumatized its way into theaters. No doubt terrifying many of the young children and probably their parents for that matter who watched it. It had been 45 long years since The Wizard of Oz came out. And it seemed that finally fans of the 1939 musical were given the sequel that they had been waiting for. But there was no happy, joyful singing munchkins in Return to Oz. There was no somewhere over the rainbow and no happy fairy tale landscapes. Nope. Instead, Return to Oz was more of a horror film. It was dark and brooding and very daring with its subject matter and fear factor. A film that was completely torn apart by film critics who didn't like the movie because it in no way resembled The Wizard of Oz. Heck, the movie was so hated, even Siskel and Ebert put it in their worst movies of 1985 list. Yet, yeah, back in the happy time of 1985, people didn't want to see Dorothy getting electric shock treatment and going on a sinister adventure in an apocalyptic Oz, complete with a witch with removable heads and evil rock demons. Without a doubt, this movie was ahead of its time. Especially considering in this day and age, everything must be dark and brooding. And despite the negative criticism it did receive from critics, it did gain a cult following from the kids who grew up watching it. And now it's time to finally see Return to Oz for the daring masterpiece it truly is. You know, it might just be that Return to Oz is the most frightening children's movie of all time. Seriously, I'm a grown ass man with no hair and there are still parts of the film that make me nervous. So to celebrate this fantastic movie, we are going to look into 10 amazing facts about Return to Oz. So let's check it out before the wheelers turn up and start terrifying everyone. Number 10, Return to Oz isn't a sequel. It is popular belief that Return to Oz is a long awaited sequel to Wizard of Oz, but in fact, it isn't. For starters, The Wizard of Oz was released by MGM and Return to Oz was released by none other than Disney. Both movies also look nothing alike, not visually or tonally. And Wizard of Oz was a musical, whereas Return to Oz is a contemporary movie without any music numbers. Also, there is a huge age gap between the actresses who played Dorothy, with Judy Garland, who was 17 when she played the role, and Feruza Bolk, who was just 10, and looked much more like a little girl. I think that the fact that the word return is in the movie's title causes people to assume the movie is a sequel, but the movie is more of a follow-up to the L. Frank Baum book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. There are some things, however, that do connect the two movies. For example, Bulk, like Garland, had brown hair, unlike the book where Dorothy was blonde. And of course, the use of the ruby slippers, which is a concept entirely made up for the Wizard of Oz film. As in the books, Dorothy's powerful footwear of mystical powers were in fact silver shoes. My guess is this is because the ruby slippers were really iconic thanks to the 1939 film and they probably felt that they had to use that concept or otherwise the younger viewers would get confused. Number nine, Return to Oz is based off two Oz books. Yeah, that's right. Unlike The Wizard of Oz, which was just based off the one book, Return to Oz is based on two of Bam's books. It's based off the second book in the series, The Marvelous Land of Oz, and the third entry, Ozma of Oz. The Marvelous Land of Oz doesn't even feature Dorothy, but is instead about a boy named Tip, who tries to stop an evil witch called Mombi. The book introduced concepts seen in the movie, such as the Powder of Life, Mombi, Jack Pumpkinhead, Gump, and the Deadly Desert. 
Ozma of Oz features Dorothy, whom, like in the film, gets swept to Oz thanks to a storm, where she must face the Gnome King and dreaded wheelers, along with teaming up with TikTok, the Mechanical Man, and of course, Princess Ozma. It really is fascinating that the movie is based on two books, because in the movie, the two stories just gel together so well. Number eight, Christopher Lloyd was considered for the role of the Gnome King. Great Scott. Yeah, Great Scott indeed. But according to some sources, when the movie was in early days of production, none other than Doc Brown himself was considered to take on the role of the evil, powerful, rock-like being, the Gnome King. It definitely would have been interesting to see Lloyd in this movie. But sadly, we never got to see a Flox Capacitor powered Gnome King as Lloyd turned down the role, probably due to the fact that he was making Back to the Future at the time. I don't know why, but I just would have loved to have seen the Gnome King screaming out about 1.21 gigawatts. Number seven, the movie has a place in the Guinness Book of Records. Yeah, although the movie may have failed to impress upon its release in 1985, it was still achievement worthy enough for the Guinness Book of Records for being a sequel that was made for the longest period of time after the original. Okay, I've already established that technically this isn't a sequel, but once again, I think it comes back down to many people thinking that it is. I guess if you wanted to be technical and bring up the ruby slippers, then I guess you could probably say it's a soft sequel. But regardless, on the account that The Wizard of Oz came out in 1939 and Return to Oz came out in 1985, placing a 46 year gap in between movies, earned it a spot in the Guinness Book of Records. And furthermore, the next big cinematic Oz adventure didn't come out until 2013 with Oz the Great and Powerful, nearly another 30 years later. Well gee whiz, at this stage, by the time the fourth Oz movie comes out, we'll all be dead. Number six, Return to Oz is the first movie to ever use the blue Disney logo. We all know the famous blue Disney logo and have no doubt seen it at some stage, where we see a blue silhouette of the Disney castle, along with a shooting star flying over it. A well-known logo that has certainly now evolved with the times. Well, Return to Oz was the first movie to use this iconic logo. You see, this film was kind of a big deal for Disney who were trying to branch out in live action movies at the time. Nowadays, it seems that Disney owns all the big popular movies, from Marvel movies to Star Wars. But back in the 80s, they weren't so successful and had many failed attempts at getting into the mainstream movie scene at that time, thanks to other not so successful attempts like Tron and Flight of the Navigator. And so I guess because they were taking a shot with the Oz name, they thought it would be the perfect time to branch out with their new logo. Number five, the other actresses who auditioned for the role of Dorothy. It's just a yellow brick. No, Belina, you don't understand. This was the yellow brick road. Okay, so Feruza Bulk was perfect as Dorothy Gale. Despite her age, she is very believable and sincere and never gets annoying or obnoxious like a lot of child actors do. And while watching the movie, I always find myself worrying for her and hoping that she'll be okay. I think when you're a little kid, especially for children, we all want to have that magical place to disappear to. We all want to be able to go to another world. But Bulk wasn't the only young actress to audition for the role. According to IMBD, some of the other young actresses to try out for the iconic part of Dorothy Gale include Drew Barrymore, Juliette Lewis, and, um, Alanis Morissette? Um, well, that would have been different. But thankfully though, Bolt got the part and the rest was history. I think that Return to Oz is, is an incredibly unique, um, surreal, amazing film, and it's got a, a lot of really serious fans. Number four, the Wheelers are impractical villains. <laughs> Come here, chicken! Okay, one of the most terrifying elements associated with this movie is without a doubt the wheelers. 
everyone who watched this movie as a kid seems to remember these guys and the subsequent nightmares they caused and probably therapy sessions for that matter. You have to come out sooner or later. And when you do, we'll tear you into little pieces and throw you in the deadly desert. Boy, did these bastards terrify me. I think it's because of the fact they have big wheels for hands and feet and it just looks so weird and so unnatural. But despite the post-traumatic stress disorder these guys have caused, you have to ask yourself, are they really that menacing? I mean, apart from laughing and screaming, there's actually not really a lot that they can do, on the account, of course, that they have no hands or feet. Okay, well after thinking about this long and hard, there is only two ways a wheeler can actually cause you any physical harm. One is they run you over. But in order to do that, they would have to charge you at a really fast speed. And thus knock you over, and then run over you. But honestly, their wheels per se in the movie don't look strong enough to actually go over a human body. The only other way they could possibly hurt you is if they get really close to you and try and bite you. But, once again, just push them away. They can't do much as they don't have hand and feet coordination. Still, I guess the way they say the word CHICKEN is pretty intimidating, so I guess there's still that. Either way, they may be a villain that can't cause any harm, but due to their funky 80s attire and taunts of ripping poor Dorothy Gale into pieces and dumping her in the deadly desert, they were still pretty intimidating and menacing. Number three, it was a one-time film for director Walter Murch. That's right, this movie was directed by one-time director Walter Murch, who actually really wanted to direct the movie, as he had a vision of the Oz universe and lobbied to Disney to give him the position of the movie's director, and even had Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas to back him up and help convince Disney to give him the chance to direct. Murch is actually a big name in the business, as he is a well-established movie editor. And before directing Return to Oz, he had edited well-established movies, The Godfather and Apocalypse Now. So the guy who directed Return to Oz previously worked on The Godfather and Apocalypse Now. And people were surprised the movie was dark? Well, I'll tell you what, it doesn't get any darker than The Godfather and Apocalypse Now. What did people expect? Sadly, Merch never went on to direct anything else after Return to Oz. I really hope that's not because he felt disheartened with all the negative criticism the movie got. It's a shame, as I feel like Return to Oz is directed brilliantly and confidently. And we missed out on seeing more movies from a potentially great movie director. Still we will always have Return to Oz. Also, the movie was produced by Gary Kurtz, who also produced the original Star Wars trilogy, which is pretty cool. Number two, the movie has an impressive cast. As mentioned, the role of Dorothy was played by legendary Feruza Bolk, who would go on to star in The Craft and American History X. In both of those movies, she played a completely crazy person, but hey, I guess that's what coming face to face with the wheelers does to you. In addition to her, there was also Pippa Laurie who played Auntie M. And for all those who don't know who Pippa Laurie is, she played Carrie's wacko mother in the original Carrie. And of course, Nicole Williamson, who played the Gnome King and the Shock Treatment Doctor. And to all you geek culture enthusiasts, Williamson played Merlin in Excalibur, the priest who gets ripped apart in The Exorcist 3, and the ancient warrior in the Spawn movie adaptation. Jean March played the witch Mombi and the evil looking nurse. She had previously starred in episodes of The Twilight Zone and Doctor Who, and was even at one stage married to third Doctor himself, John Pertwee. Yes indeed guys, Doctor Who's wife is indeed the witch from Return to Oz. You know, it's when we get clashes of fandom with this magnitude that I really like being a pop cultural detective. And then there are also the performers of the puppet characters. Like Jim Henson's son, Brian Henson, who played Jack Pumpkinhead and would go on to play Hoggle in Labyrinth. Then there's the guy who played TikTok, gymnast Michael Sundin, 
who in order to make the robot move had to spend his entire movie scenes bent down. Wow, the poor guy. But it totally paid off. Number 1. The movie is about not letting the hierarchy destroy creativity. At the start of the movie, we learn that Dorothy isn't sleeping much because she often thinks about her first trip to Oz and recollects on her adventures there. Auntie Anne thinks that these thoughts are getting in the way of her farming chores. So in order to rid Dorothy of her daydreams, she sends Dorothy to a clinic where Dorothy would undergo electric shock treatment in order to erase Oz from her head. There is a sentiment here about technology being this new industrial manufactured tool used to destroy the wonder and imagination of a child, so Dorothy can be more structured and molded for a work routine. Dr. Worley tries to assure Dorothy that the machine is safe and even tries to convince her that his machine is fun and playful, showing her that the machine has a face, which still doesn't make it look any less terrifying. Seriously, look at that thing! Dr. Worley even describes Dorothy's thoughts about Oz as quote unquote nasty dreams despite the fact that they aren't nasty. And throughout the hospital scenes, horrific screams and moans from patients can be heard. It's honestly terrifying. And during a storm, Dorothy escapes where she supposedly goes back to Oz. In fact, the movie could be interpreted that Dorothy did indeed undergo electric shock treatment, and the events that unfold, such as her trip to Oz, are all part of a lucid dream about Dorothy's internal struggle to save her individuality and imagination. Hence the fact that Oz looks so run down and destroyed. It represents Dorothy's creativity and imagination being destroyed. So Dorothy must save Oz, thus her creativity and individuality. Hence why the Gnome King wants to turn Dorothy into an ornament. A thoughtless object of the system and also why with each lightning strike of one of her friends becoming ornaments, the Gnome King becomes more powerful. Could the lightning strikes represent the electric currents of Dorothy's treatment? To me, it's all about fighting mind control, and the movie is as every bit as horrific as mind control. Dorothy must restore Oz and her friends in order to get back home and to be happy once again where she wakes up apparently fine now, without the horrific use of electric shock treatment. What I get from this movie is that it's okay for children to be creative and to use their imaginations, and to not let the cold-blooded, industrial, work-orientated hierarchy destroy the purity of imagination. And interestingly enough, going back to Dr. Worley's face machine, He's trying to use technology to destroy Dorothy's playful imagination while trying to get her to playfully imagine that his machine has a face, which is a flawed and hypocritical ethic. Oh, the irony. Well guys, that was my loving look into Return to Oz. I hope that, like me, you get a lot of joy out of this movie and give the movie the praise and recognition that it deserves. It is definitely worthy of more appraisal and recognition. Even if the movie is utterly terrifying. But hey, kids love scary movies. And as a kid, I always wanted to watch Return to Oz over The Wizard of Oz. Anyway, I'm Minty, and if you ever find yourself in the land of Oz, do not take a chicken with you. Them wheelers, they will get in your face and they will... Um, I don't know. Wheeler you to death or something. See ya.